know is full of stories. And perhaps the most novelistic of the stories in the Bible is the story of Joseph and his brothers. And uh, inevitably, some great novelist <coughs> would novelize this story, and Thomas Mann wrote a four-volume <coughs> novel called Joseph and His Brothers, and there's a line from it that I want to lift out to sort of keynote uh, what I'm talking about. As we know, Joseph is sold by his envious brothers into slavery, and in Egypt, is bought by a nobleman named Potiphar, and because of his talents and whatever, rises to uh, be the overseer of Potiphar's household, comes to the attention of Mrs. Potiphar, Potiphar's wife, and uh, who, would, who has adulterous designs on him. Is there somebody who's trying to get uh, And so Mon, uh, novelizes the back and forth between them, Joseph is resistant to the idea, and at one point he puts forth the following argument for Potiphar's wife. Mutt, he says, have a care for your story. I can easily imagine that somebody could write a book about this, and how would you look in a book? Okay, Genesis, you know, she's not a big heroine. Uh, so uh, that would be a, a kind of a case in point of the consideration of how to live one's story and what a story looks like, but perhaps it doesn't shed enough light because people are apt to discount stories in the Bible. That's the Bible. You know, what about now? The Bible is perhaps poetry. We live in prose. The Bible is ancient. We are modern people. What's the relevance of the Joseph story? And I want to contend that it's fairly relevant because stories like the stories in the Joseph story in the Bible are still happening, and all of us are still living them. So, uh, and you might want to say at this point, well, prove it. Give me an example. What, do you, what on earth do you mean? Glad you asked, because <laughs> I have an example or two to give you. Um, many years ago, I was a young assistant professor of philosophy at a certain college, which we'll call Gridlock College, you know, just for um, uh, anonymity's sake. And a, um, a, a uh, election for the post of leader of the department was scheduled, and the department was not untypically for an academic department, riven by factions, and there was a stronger faction in terms of the numbers and the seniority that backed a candidate for chairman that I thought not really qualified, and then a smaller and weaker uh, faction of young people who didn't have job security that backed a candidate that I thought more qualified. The day before the election, uh, a senior professor who backed the stronger, uh, uh, was part of the stronger coalition, came to observe my teaching hour. Now, and to write a report, a teaching observation report. These reports go into the personnel file, and if it's a negative one, you get fired. Uh, so we had the teaching hour, and then he invited me to tea afterwards. And uh, at the tea uh, in a nearby diner, the talk happened to turn to the election the next day, and uh, he gave his opinion of his favorite candidate, and I gave my opinion of his favorite candidate, <laughs> and he said, uh, well, if he's as bad as you say he is, how do you explain a man like me backing him? <laughs> so glad you asked. You know, 
Uh, they say before you die, your whole life flashes before you die. Before you die professionally, a lot of things flash before me, and I'll mention them. The students in the borough of Brooklyn are streetwise. They can tell a phony. I'm not a brave person. I don't have quite the courage to stand in front of students and praise noble and sublime and beautiful things like Socrates and the martyrdom of Socrates, and they're looking at me and they're seeing a phony. Second, once I do something or say something that goes against what I think is the better course to take, like most people, I will immediately rationalize it. My mind, my brain, will be filled with the excuses to explain why I did this. Now, there are painters who work with paint. There are carpenters who work with wood. Philosophers work with thought. And so, if, say, two-thirds of my thought-holding capacity is taken up with these rationalizations, there's not going to be that much left to do any good work in my field. The third thing is a kind of instinct. This was long before I had the notion of story, but I had the sense if I answer him as he expects, I will be a kind of imitation of who I was before. Mm. The body will be there, the words will be there, but I'll be absent. I will have evicted myself from the story of me. So, no surprise about my answer. I said, you know, it's very hard to explain because I've read your article on blah, 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 and I think you're a very intelligent man. So I can only suppose that he's weak and you think you can use him. <laughs> um, the next six years ensued in the following way. I was fired at the first opportunity. Since they were the gang that couldn't shoot straight and the union took up my cause, on technicalities, technical violations, I'd be reinstated, promptly fired again, reinstated, fired again, and every year that I'd be back on this uh, chancy basis, people would come in to evaluate my work and my teaching who were adversaries. My personnel file began to look like the file of somebody who not only couldn't get work at Gridlock College, couldn't get work in America. <laughs> so, um, it's the sixth year of this process. My father has died. He's a, also a philosopher, um, and possibly prematurely because of watching all this. Uh, and I'm trudging with a satchel in hand uh, toward um, the higher education headquarters for another hearing. I'm alone. Um, I want to kind of it's heighten the notion of alone. When you get into a fight like this, the well-meaning sort of Job's comforters will explain, drop it, Abigail. You're getting to be obsessed. You wouldn't have done this if you hadn't been self-destructive. You know, you hear an awful lot of psychology, uh, and so you feel invisible. I'm trudging along. I don't know if I'm in despair, but I'm kind of without hope. Um, despair is too active. <laughs> uh, and suddenly, something appears behind me. It's a row of figures behind me, and they seem to be connected as if an umbilical cord is running through me and running through each of these figures. They have black curled beards. They have silvery 
garments which are shimmering. You can't see their feet and they seem to be vibrating quicker than we vibrate. I've never realized we vibrate, but perhaps we do because I, the comparison occurred to me. They went back and back and back in a lineage and I could feel where that began. It began where Jewish time begins. They went back to Ur of the Chaldees. And they were saying to me uh, really two things, or three things. They had been there the whole time. I hadn't been alone. Uh, that I'd been on a pilgrimage and it was over. Uh, and the path, they were on a path and it was made of finer stuff. It was about a foot and a half off the pavement. And it wound to a close just at the door of the headquarters where my hearing was to be held. So it was clear that the verbal, it is over, and the path that wound to a close, uh, those, the image sort of confirmed the words. And, uh, I want to say something about how customized this vision was for me. Um, first of all, a sense of being totally alone and ridiculous, you know, self-destructive, uh, obsessive, all these psychological words are, are words of, in a way, ridicule. So ridiculous, no sane person would be in this fix. Oh no, they don't think that. And I'm not alone. The second thing is that um, when you're in a combat with an institution and it goes on for years and years and years, there are all kinds of sub-fights and sub-subordinate uh, happenings. And you begin to think, this isn't a single effort. It ramifies their branches. It goes out and out and out. I wouldn't know how to describe everything that's happened. And it feels as if the original point has got lost in all these branches and, and sub-points. But the, the singularity <coughs> of the path that they were on and the word pilgrimage said a unified, a single effort, and of course they seem to be more than human, a, an, a single effort with a sanctified purpose. The third thing customized for me, um, as anyone who's a congregant with me knows, I'm not a wonderfully observant a Jewish person. But on the very deepest level, sort of below the level of what do you do and what do you believe and <coughs> who are you anyway, in a very deeply essential way, I'm Jewish. And if figures appear so intimately connected to me and going back to the beginning of Jewish time, that goes beneath the, uh, the level of argument. That, that reaches me. If God wanted to get my attention, <coughs> that'll do it. Yeah. So this is a, a customized, apparently, vision. Uh, I go to the hearing. Uncharacteristically, I don't fight for myself. I don't watch everything that's going on. I'm all out of ideas. I'm just sitting there hoping the fix is in. You know, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm up in Maine a few weeks later where my parents had a house. My mother's there. The union calls and says, you're being returned to the college for another year of evaluation. And I turned to my mother and I said, in tears, they lied to me. And I didn't mean the board, I didn't mean the union, mm -hmm. I didn't mean my adverse, I meant those figures. They lied to me, it wasn't over. So I go back to the college. There's another year of this nightmare, of teaching observation reports. Uh, nobody's asking me to tea anymore. Um, and the end of it, the, 
The following June, the union calls again. You've been reinstated with tenure, that means job security, retroactive to the previous June. At that point, I use for the first time the word miracle because I'll just read what I've written here. I felt it as a miracle of a specific type, the visitation's embeddedness in the time-bound world and the power of the messengers to ring changes in the past to future timeline identified the thing for me as a miracle of a specifically Jewish type, a grounded miracle. There was no suspension of the laws of nature, but it was in time. It was an appearance with an empirical reality working with that dimension rather than trying to suspend or overturn it. That would incline me to take it seriously as a message from the God whose character I could recognize. Um, To the oldest friend I have, I, I gave a report of what had happened, and she had some of the lore of the shtetl in her background, a, a Jewish village in the old country, and I described the physical appearance of these figures, and she said, angels, they were angels. And I said, I thought angels were blonde and had wings. <laughs> she said, not Jewish angels. <laughs> uh, um, so, back to the college. Uh, now, what happens in the college? A lot of people said, oh, it will be terrible. You know, you, you'll feel all this resentment and they'll feel bitter and to see you back. I happen to have some neurons missing that transmit the resentment uh, signals. So I didn't feel resentment. I was just glad to be back. And I didn't feel that there were personal vibes of a negative kind. There was only one problem. I was delighted to be back teaching. But during the time I'd been out of teaching, I'd been fighting this fight and trying to get part-time work. And I had done no significant work in philosophy. And I was now in danger of being the world's oldest assistant professor. <coughs> Academic life is hierarchical. It's not an honor to be at the bottom of the pecking order. Uh, and so you would think that what I ought to do is really get to work double time to get some books, get some articles published, you know, write a book, uh, do, do what you do. I did not do that because my philosopher father, when he died, had left a manuscript unpublished on two 17th century philosophers, Thomas Hobbes and Baruch Spinoza. And uh, I felt it was my primary obligation to attend to that manuscript, even if it put the effort to get promoted even further back. Once again, Job's comforters step up. Uh, life is for the living. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, get over your father fixation. Uh, you know, that's not healthy. Healthy is, you know, what's good for you? Do what's good for you. Nobody goes for filial piety anymore. That's so yesterday, um, I'll just quote something here. My father had been one of the few interesting, truthful, and original men I had known in my life. His unspoken expectation that I would edit his final work and get it published had for me the force of a deathbed promise. My honor was bound up in it. And for that reason, I asked to teach modern philosophy, which starts with these 17th century figures, whenever it was offered by the department. 
the scene now shifts. The department every year gave an annual lecture. It was the high point of the academic year, and colleagues from other departments were invited, people from the great public were invited. It was our major event. It was the annual lecture, and we always invited a distinguished speaker. This year, we had invited a distinguished British <coughs> philosopher who had written a book on Spinoza. <coughs> the study of Spinoza's ethics was in the book. And usually, the invited speaker comes to lunch with us, gives the speech, answers questions, or I don't know if he answers questions. Anyway, also goes to supper, to dinner with us. So it's a, you know, it's a very formal event. Lunch came and went. No distinguished speaker. Uh, the speech is to start at three. A very large room is filling up. It's about 20 to three. No distinguished speaker. And I say to the chair, or somebody says, Eric, maybe you should call and find out what's wrong. Maybe he's stuck in traffic, who knows. I hear a scream. Eric, my, the chair, is not given to screaming. Uh, what's wrong, Eric? He never left. He thought the lecture was scheduled for tomorrow. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's why you should never do these things, Larry. Don't be in this business. <laughs> oh, what do we do now? So I turn to a senior colleague who's a friend, and I say, well, Elmer, what do we do? And Elmer, in his Midwestern accent, says, Eric goes up to the mic, he steps on the stage, and says, the speaker is not here. He thought the lecture was tomorrow. Now you should all go home. I thought that's a good idea. Uh, the provost happened to overhear this. Now, if you're old enough to remember uh, Mae West and Ethel Merman, figure a woman who combines those qualities. The provost <laughs> is a very forceful lady. Nobody crosses Ethel. <laughs> she comes over and she says, Surely someone in the department can say something about Spinoza. And I'm thinking, well, I know someone who could, but she doesn't want to. <laughs> I have to tell you something about philosophers. Philosophy is not a normal subject. It's a combat zone. It's a boxing ring. You get up there, and everybody is out to get you. If you're scheduled to give a paper, you spend the time, a little like a lawyer, what will the opposition say from every side? You know, you're up till three in the morning thinking of counter arguments. And so we are not eager to give impromptu speeches. And so Elmer says, no Ethel, we are going to tell them all to go home. Ethel. I'm very disappointed in the philosophy department. When Ethel's disappointed, all of us will soon be disappointed. <laughs> you know, there goes paper clips, there goes stationery, there go any new hires. We're herstory, you know. Uh, and I had to, okay, Eric, I'll do it. I can say something about the life. You know, I thought these people are not interested in the metaphysics, I'll talk about the life. Spinoza had a very interesting and worthwhile life. He, he had a story, he lived his thought. So that is interesting. So I get up there, uh, the announcement has just been made, the speaker is still in Syracuse, a moan, <laughs> audible moan, stage business, only it's not a play. Um, and all the heads are down. And the provost is in the front row, and I can see what a nice coiffure you have as <laughs> that head is down. Uh, and I've got a few notes from my class in modern philosophy, and I start speaking. Um, 
And I'm noticing it's sort of like the Rockettes, the heads go up and they're smiling. And oh, I have this audience in the palm of my hand. And then the next thought, God is doing a miracle. That it comes to my mind, I kid you not, this is exactly what I'm thinking. It's a miracle. I suddenly I understand. Um, when the talk is over, the president of the college shows up and he says, I missed the talk, but I hear Abigail saved the annual lecture. Um, and then he says to his seconds in command, write me, a write Abigail a letter with copies to me telling what happened at this lecture. And he pats his vest, his expensive vest, it's service to the college. The promotion goes through the next year. <laughs> um, so, uh, in the letters, they say things like, quote, to deliver on no prior notice whatever, so elegant, precise, lucid, intelligent, and subtly modulated a presentation was an act to provoke not merely praise, but astonishment, okay. The question now uh, for us is, why did I say to myself, God is doing a miracle? What validates a miracle? Obviously, if somebody had been walking on water or raised from the dead or cured leprosy overnight, uh, yeah. That's super, supernatural, but no unnatural, no suspension of the laws of nature had taken place. Everything that happened could be written off and has been by people to whom I tell the story. Coincidence. What, now I have a, a certain tendency, uh, Jerry says I have the gift of belief and I don't think it's a compliment. <laughs> you know, I'm sort of open to the possibility it might be a miracle. But what about the reasonable person? What, what reasons would you have for saying miracle? Let me go back to the Bible for a minute. There are people who treat the Bible as a literary work, as poetry or something, folk expression of a people's legends. But there are people who are interested in showing the historicity of the Bible. And that dispute is still open, it's not closed, but there, there's evidence that at least some incidents in the Bible could be traced to um, evidence of an empirical kind that is established archeologically or philologically or in some way that is, uh, makes it reasonable to think something like this happened. But nothing can say that God was present in any of the Bible stories. You can't, there's no archeological or philological evidence of that kind. Now, the historicity of what happened, a lot of people witnessed, uh, not the vision of the um, Jewish angels, but the, what happened at the annual lecture was not something that would have to be dug up by a you know, researcher. Uh, uh, so that's not what we're talking about. But what makes me think there's a God who's doing this? So it's not just an accident. What would be a reasonable argument for the conclusion that a God was behind these things? Can't you find a yeah. chair? Go ahead. <laughs> Nice to, nice to see you. Right You'll have to imagine what happened before. <laughs> <laughs> but I know, you, you know you're, you're up to the task. Um, uh, if I'm reasoning in a legal context, re reasoning occurs in a context. Suppose I want to find out if the accused is guilty. The context is the statute that forbids a certain crime. 
in that context, I can look at you know, what the evidence shows the accused to have done or not to have done, and it's reasonable to find him not guilty or to find him or her guilty. Uh, if I want to uh, do a great Monet-style water a painting of a lily pond, it's reasonable for me, supposing I'm a painter as good as Monet, to get a easel, a palette, uh, some paint brushes, and some tubes of color, and that would be uh, a way to get to my um, objective. Reasons are not found in a vacuum. People estimate reasons in the light of what they want to do and why they want to do it. The view that God is a player in the realm of human action is not less reasonable than the view that God is not a player, but as a reason, it explains and justifies a different sort of doing and wanting to do. So as I think back over these experiences at Gridlock College, I can discern four relevant ways of life, ways of doing and wanting to do. The first three would be warranted if you assume God doesn't exist. They'd be reasonable. Only the fourth way of living is justified by the assumption that there is a God. So let's go through these four four different ways of life, ways of doing and wanting to motivational and practical ways of living, and uh, see what the one, how the one with God in it compares to the other three. I've given the four ways of life names, the cynic, the therapist, the stoic, the pilgrim, four ways. Start with a cynic. Here's how he sounds. No one cares how this fight, the academic fight, started or why you were fired. It's trivial academic politics. You are all alone, lady. In 100 years, in 50 years, no one will care about these dust-ups. There are no a priori fixed rules for conduct, no boundaries fixed uh, for that constrain human acts. What there are are clues. And you've got to look at the clues for what the stronger party of the moment finds expedient, finds useful. That's enough to make very clear how the weaker parties ought to act. You vote for the candidate backed by the stronger party, and you shut up about it. Thank you. <laughs> we appreciate your input. <laughs> Advisor one. Advisor two, the therapist. As you see, I've had a lot of contact with him <laughs> through these years. Uh, he cares. It's not true that nobody cares. This is a caring world. For now, your future depends on the opportunities that present themselves, says the therapist, and the protection you can find. Avoid the big risks. You vote for the candidate backed by the power, and then later on, when you have power, you can help somebody, and maybe you'll help somebody to vote his or her conscience without risk to yourself. But if you don't survive, how can you help anybody? Thank you, therapist. The third one, the stoic. The stoic is a noble character. It has courage. You are alone, says the stoic. You don't have to please others. You have to live with yourself. The poet Auden says, we are left alone with our day, and the time is short, and history to the defeated may say alas, but cannot help or pardon. 
says the Stoic, the decent players are usually outnumbered, outmaneuvered, outraged, ambushed. Your conscience says vote no, vote no. There will be reprisals, that's inevitable. Fight as long as you can. Be prepared to lose early or late. The good guys lose. Those are the probabilities. When I won, I was called by the former chair of the Princeton Philosophy Department. That's as prestigious a philosophy department as you get. And he said, I hear you won. To tell you the truth, I never thought you would. The probabilities are against it. There's a fourth advisor whom I call the pilgrim. The pilgrim, I guess he orchestrates the pilgrimages. <laughs> um, that's, um, he's got a different view of reality. Uh, for the pilgrim, God is not just nature or energy or something like that. Uh, he's not the big ocean into which the drops, which look like individuals, melt finally in Samadhi and Advaita Vedanta and, and all these systems of a mystical type. God is more like the God in Hebrew scripture. Um, he's distant from the created world and from us, and the distance facilitates visibility. If you're ocean or if you're energy, there's no need to see. You simply are, and you meld into whatever else is. But if there's this distance, it creates visibility. It, it allows visibility. So, um, You are visible. If you're visible, then what happens to you is visible. And the witness to it, the divine witness, is watching a story unfold because that's real. You're, you're real. The things you engage in and the challenge you really are there. I was visible to the senior colleague who took me to tea. I was visible to my students in Brooklyn. And according to, witness, to, according to the pilgrim, I was and am visible to the divine witness. So in that worldview, it's not just pushing and pulling. It's seeing and being seen. And there are obligations that come with that visibility. Uh, first and last, the obligation, if you see two courses to take and one appears to you clearly better than the other, you're obligated to take the better uh, path. Why? Where does this obligation come from? If you take what you know to be the worst path, you'll be making excuses for it, they will be insincere, your vote will be irresponsible, and in a sense, you're no longer a play, the real you is no longer a player in the real story. So as someone who is visible, you sort of, it's like an actor who walks off the stage. You know, you're, you're in a play, say your lines. Then there's the story you're in, if it's a better and a worse kind of ch challenge, um, what makes a story interesting is when the lead player, as we all are in our stories, opts for the better course, and then what follows, follows. If the lead player decides, hey, I'm gonna take an addictive substance, and then I'm gonna take a more addictive, beyond gateway drug, then I'm gonna commit a criminal act to pay for my habit, then I'm gonna wreck my family. This is very boring. You know, <laughs> this is really, they write a lot of novels like that now. I wish they would stop. <laughs> uh, okay, so you carry the story, 
take it forward. You're in a story. Uh, a, f a third reason. What about your adversaries? Um, if, as you suspect, they've taken their uh, measures to stop you and ruin your life, your career, your, your working life, um, and they have bad reasons for what they did, uh, they'll have to defend their bad reasons if you fight them. And they may get sick of hearing themselves do that <laughs> after a while. <clears throat> so give them the chance to get sick of themselves. Don't just leave them in glory. Have pity on them. Have mercy. Uh, and there's another thing. Uh, Plato, in his Republic, uh, makes clear that the unhappiest man is the successful tyrant. I think Plato's argument is a good one. It, it's persuasive to me. You don't want that to happen to your enemies. You don't want them to be so unhappy that they succeed. It, that miserable fate, Chairman Mao, Comrade Stalin, Der Fuhrer, not happy. These are not good lives. If possible, you want to help them not get all the way to the top of the tyrant's um, pathway. So you want to be kind to your enemies. And there's somebody else you ought to consider, and that's the bystanders. At one point in my seven-year fight, I said to my mother, Mother, I want to die. And she said, uh, let's have lunch first. <laughs> and she knew she was. And so I laid out the, the, what my uh, combat looked like on that day. And she said, very seriously, you have to fight it. And if you fight it, people will step forward to help you whom you do not know now. You have, so the, the moral here, you have an obligation. If anybody wants to help, give them the chance. Don't rat out before you give them the chance to help. So those are your obligations. The pilgrim reminds us that the conditions for human wholeness are not just ethical or psychological. They are also surprisingly novelistic or literary. You have a responsibility, as Joseph said to Potiphar's wife, have a care for your story. <coughs> now, um, I just want to point out again that in the effort to live my story, I was not the only player. Um, there were some things I could bring about. The union said I was the hardest working client they'd ever had, so that, you know, that that took a lot of time, but there were some things I could not have brought about. The Jewish angels who said it's over, and it was over, but retroactively, I couldn't have done that. Um, since I had, as I believe, saved my philosophical abilities by not selling my vote, I was prepared to work on my father's book and not uh, be crushed by the therapeutic advice I was getting about father fixation and all that. Um, but I had no power to make the invited speaker be speaking on Spinoza and miss his appointed day. That, that was... Uh, that was uh, not of my doing. So um, it seems that <laughs> what I could never have imagined or foreseen was that all these threads would be woven together to compose a single story. While speaking, I had the pleasure of explaining to any former adversaries who might have wondered 
about it, Spinoza's recipe for avoiding resentment. Insofar as the talk had merit, I could show that my firing hadn't been necessarily deserved. A student said to me afterwards, one of my students, when you talked about Spinoza, it was like you were talking about your brother. <laughs> uh, my decision to take time out from my career to work on my father's book, um, how could I have imagined that that would have been the very thing to move me up the academic uh, ladder? Uh, it seems in nature, when you look at design features, the parts do not explain the whole. The whole explains the parts. The function of the cell explained in terms of the needs of the organ, the needs of the organ explained in terms of the needs of the organism. The higher order relations explain why the parts are disposed as they are. In the annual lecture, the parts of what went into that story worked together with precision to effect the plot line of the whole narrative, but the components, each by itself, did not explain the plot line. The interaction between the components that came together in the lecture story cannot be comprehended except insofar as they are seen to realize in a single happening separate purposes that were mine. The person I had been all along became more intelligible through this weaving together. If it takes one to know one, the God who is a person could see how to integrate these disparate purposes to bring out the shape of the story in me. A lot of purposes besides mine were realized. The department's reputation was saved. The college's facade to the greater public was maintained. The people who came to hear a talk were properly served. Um, a wide sweep of purposes were realized in addition to my private ones, and nobody was injured. In direct rejoinder to the cynic, the therapist, and the stoic, isn't this just what one would expect if God were the co-author? <laughs> so, if there are any questions, uh, feel free to raise them. Uh, let me just note that uh, our speakers latest book, A Good Look at Evil, is available at a discounted price here uh, this afternoon. But please go ahead and, and raise whatever questions you may have for the poorer speaker. Okay, uh, so we're talking about a philosophical point of view of God. God. We have a different idea about what it means. But we in a Jewish institution, we are Jews. You feel for some time in your life, you're Jewish. I did not feel it, but I understand. But, okay, can you explain to me what philosopher you of Jews, by Jews, persecuted for a thousand years? Jews hate it right now, all around. Why? Maybe God encouraged to do it, or he a different way to do it? How we can explain this? Well, thank you very much for that uh, question. I think it's a deep one. Um, and uh, like you, I've reflected a lot about it. Um, my, there's a book forthcoming called Blaming the Jews, The Persistence of a Delusion by a British analytic philosopher named Bernard Harrison in which a as yet unpublished manuscript by me is, all, is cited uh, and uh, um, I think there are explanations that would satisfy a philosopher but we'll have to go into them when we have time. Yes. Uh, isn't there a, a surface irony in, in the miracle scenario you described uh, that uh, given the fact that Spinoza, 
who was uh, in the religious community's eyes of his time an apostate and was effectively excommunicated from the Jewish community that this miracle occurred uh, for the purpose of your elucidating his life and perhaps his thought as well. Seems like there's a, there's a surface irony. There. Yeah, beautifully asked and the answer is yes. <laughs> I mean, he didn't deny the possibility of divinity, but he simply defined it other than the religious orthodoxy of his time would have had it. Yeah, I, when I taught uh, Spinoza, I would sometimes say, and it was not entirely a joke, Spinoza describes God as having infinitely many infinite attributes, uh, only two of which are discernible to us empirically. And I would add, and my favorite one of the infinite attributes is God as the God of Israel. <laughs> it had to be, yes, it was ironic. Within the uh, story of the the uh, the firings and the reinstatements and the firings again and the uh, uh, the fights uh, and you're talking about the, the viewpoints of the sto the stoic and the uh, the therapist and at the time uh, you don't have this whole synthesized uh, picture of the divinity so what's what's it seems as though you're saying is you're really at this point acting in the sense of the stoic because no. you're uh, yeah, uh, I mean at the time uh, as you're going forward it's it's the stoic that's really the uh, arbiter yeah of what I you're wasn't, doing? Uh, you know you're perfectly right that this sort of crisp and delineated portrait of these options was not worked out at the time I was living this, but you know I would revisit the experience again and again, trying to see with clarity uh, what had happened. But I don't think I ever was temperamentally a stoic. Uh, I admire people who are. I don't happen to be one. I, I'm a little more hopeful than a stoic. I I. Uh, I have what I call, um, what I hope I call, uh, hopefully call, intelligent hope, which is some kind of a sense. You've got a situation that's chaotic that looks like a big schmear. The first thing to do is to make it clearer. What are the stakes? What what's actually going on here? And sometimes I will take a stand what looks like a quixotic or a losing situation because for my own sake I want to know is this one of those fashionably absurd moments that the absurdists write about they write their novels they write their philosophical works about how everything is so absurd and I'm thinking well maybe it is but I need to find out whether it is so let me try to make order and then maybe it won't look so absurd. So I don't think that's quite what a Stoic does. But, but go ahead. But if, if I may, yes. uh, what's guiding at that point, uh, and I guess that, that would tie into what the whole definition is of, of good, as opposed to yeah. good and evil, is that there's a sense of integrity and truth mm -hmm. that's being pursued, and that's really what the, what the goal is, and in the sense that that's... Uh, I mean, the Stoic is saying, uh, this is what you think is right, you should cling to what you think is right. Uh, the essential direction that the Stoic or whoever it is is pursuing uh, was probably, is what, what's known to you at the time. Yeah. And uh, later the concept, the entire concept of the divine is, is uh, playing out, but it's in retrospect. I think, yeah. Uh, the kind of miracles I'm talking about happen in retrospect. They're not happening while, while you're a player. I admire the Stoic, and I think there's a truth in what the Stoic represents, but the Stoic is a little bit abstract for me. You know, he's, he's a certain kind of a Greek uh, or a classical Hellenistic thinker, and uh, 
um, reason is what he thinks is the animating uh, principle. And I'm a little more uh, novelistic than a stoic. I, I think of flesh and blood people and what they're actually on about. And, uh, I'm not trying to be free of desire the way the stoic is. I'm trying to see how real people's lives play out. So I think the stoic might find me a little distasteful. <laughs> yes. In a, in a recent uh, Circle of Friends uh, event, uh, we screened the movie Denial, which uh, involved another American professor, Deborah Lipstadt. Oh, yes. Have we seen that? Who, uh, so. who was sued yeah. uh, by a British Holocaust denier. Yeah. I, I wonder if, from your perspective, given the outcome of that very high profile suit in Britain, if, if you would see that in miraculous terms. Oh, very possibly. Very possibly. You know, these things. Was it a miracle? Is this or that a miracle? Um, I gave reasons why I think God was a player in the stories I've told. I think God is a player in the world. When all looks lost, we haven't seen all. Uh, at the same time, I would be very far from saying a happy ending is guaranteed that Deborah Lipsha was going to win her lawsuit. Wonderful she did. Uh, she had to fight pretty hard uh, to do it, be pretty smart, pretty courageous. And true uh, to her story. Yes, yes. Uh, I would say she did her part, and it wouldn't surprise me if God's the other player. but. I have two quick thoughts, and neither of them deeply philosophical. One is, you reminded me that uh, coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous. And the second thing to the gentleman over here, um, I, I've never, uh, I never read the Bible until I met Jerry. And after reading the Bible for the first time, I came, I have a very deep appreciation for the Jewish people I never had before. And so while there are people who don't like Jews, there are people like me, Christians, who have adopted Jews and want to protect them. And so uh, sometimes that, that, that occurs as well. So there, there are not just people who hate Jews. There are also people who have learned to love them and appreciate them and appreciate your history. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you would talk a bit about tiny miracles. You know, there are the big ones when the angels appear, you know, and there's lightning in the sky. And there's also the things that work out so great for us but also the tiny miracles that we don't appreciate moment to moment. Would you elaborate on that? Can you give an example oh, sorry. or two? Well, what I was thinking about uh, was, that's a tiny miracle right there. You know, you gave me a chance to speak a little <laughs> bit. Be my guest. I, I think that everybody does have a miraculous story. Yes. Um, and our job, if we're gonna cooperate with God is to strive to see that story. You know, I'm thinking of Victor Frankl, you know, in the, in the death camp. But there was this story there ready to be born. And I think your, your telling your story is so wonderful because there's a lot of, quote, failure in the story. But for all of us who've experienced different kinds of failures, God somehow turns those into major miracles. I, I started with tiny miracles, but I think there are major miracles. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Ray. That's a wonderful comment. I, I will say um, philosophers don't talk like this. <laughs> this is not how we do our business. <laughs> there are theistic philosophers that has come to be more respectable and they defend their creeds and their doctrines in various ways. 
and I have a lot of respect. They, they often have absolutely top of the line intellects, but what happens to most of us in civilian life are these miracles that often we don't talk about, you know, these coincidences, these uh, providential fingerprints on a situation, uh, the sense that we are not the only players on the scene, and often because of the secular age we live in, we want to avoid appearing, uh, you know, to have gone around the bend. Uh, we we want to be one of the gang, we want to belong. We do not talk about this. And in my métier, in my walk of life, uh, we don't. So to, um, in a sense, and I don't know, yeah, <laughs> This, was a, this cha chapter from which I've drawn this paper was originally an article, and I sent it to all the relevant philosophical journals, and I had back a sheaf of rejection letters that I really would have liked to frame, <laughs> because they said things like, I mean, a little bit making a joke of it, but the, the gist of it seemed to be, I hope God won't strike me dead for turning this article <laughs> down, but you know it just doesn't fit our needs this month, or something like that. And they would convey to me that they believed me, but this isn't what we call philosophy. This isn't how we do the the the, the thing. And uh, finally, it occurred to me as I was reprinting a good look at evil. And I already had another long uh, uh, chapter, which was too long to submit as an article. I, I think Jerry and I over breakfast thought, well, make it, you know, part four of the book. And so, th and of course it makes the book better, so I have to thank all these, um, you know, wonderful <laughs> editors who rejected uh, this essay. Uh, you were doing God's work, fellas. <laughs> <laughs> yes. In my own country, I didn't believe in God because I was not allowed <coughs> to believe in God. Yeah. So, so in the effect of that here now is a miracle. Mm -hmm. yes. But uh, my question is about reason and coincidence. We had an argument with our son, who is 50 now. He is a libertarian. Jew, of course, brought from the old country, believing nothing. And here, he participated in Jewish life like an obligation. How do you think, is it possible maybe, I don't think it is, but everybody says, you just wait, you just wait, I'm waiting. How to convince people who don't believe in miracles, they consider them coincidences. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, behind the disbelief is a worldview, at least that's what I've argued here. You either think everything's an accident, or you think uh, maybe there's human compassion, but you have to protect yourself and be compassionate toward yourself, and so don't buck the tide, don't, don't uh, oppose more powerful forces, or you think, yes, uh, conscience has a place in the world, but if you act your conscience, you'll be destroyed, but do it anyway, Dafka. Um, how one moves from one worldview to the next, I think, is the question behind your question. It's very hard to say. It's a fascinating question. Uh, I myself have moved from one worldview to the next, and it's possible that many people here have. Um, and what tips it? What, you know, uh, when a scientific hypothesis is overthrown by one experiment, uh, it 
it's deceptively clear why it's been refuted, but actually there have been a number of anomalies. So the question is, why did that one exper that one experiment tip the balance so that we now are no longer Newtonians or Einsteinians or whatever we now are? Uh, something similar for us. You can have a lot of evidences for a worldview you don't hold, and then one thing can tip it. And what, it, what that one thing is for one person or another is very hard to predict. Yeah. You know, I think uh, my long life experience showed me or proved me that uh, even in the old country, I just had this experience. Whoever will, um, hurts me pays consequences, pays price. I didn't understand why. I just intuitively saw that. I know history. When I came here, I have the explanation now. So I think that um, for such people who are still in the reasoning field, uh, I think they may come to spirituality through suffering. It's a big teacher, but it doesn't teach everybody. You know, it, it, it's strange. Uh, suffering's probably underrated in its <laughs> educational uh, power, but uh, it doesn't have power over everybody. It, but who knows? Maybe the world. Yeah, who knows? Who knows? Human beings are not predictable. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think I understand philosophy at all. So this might not have anything to do with philosophy. But my, my, I have a question and then I'll make a comment and depend on your answer. You taught many years. Did you love teaching and did your students like kids understanding that this was the last teaching hour wrote little um, comments of appreciation which I promptly framed and are uh, hanging on my, my study. Yes, I did love teaching. Okay. Yeah. Well, then, then, there was, then I think there was a plan for you to continue teaching, you know, with getting the tenure and, and persevering, you know, year after year and going back. seems like there was, it's like there was a plan. Now I studied with my brother, he's Orthodox, and we uh, read the Bible and other things. Uh, but there was one thing that came up that he's, um, God knows everything that's going to happen, but we have free will. Now I'm not sure how to reconcile that. I'm not even sure what it means. Um, but it just seems to me that there was some sort of plan. It's a funny thing, yeah. For you know, you, you don't, teaching. you certainly don't know in advance. That's Susan's point about the Stoics' readiness to be defeated. Uh, yeah, you don't know, you can't say there's a plan as you embark, as you, you know, step off the cliff um, and, abandon reliance on the protections of an institution and a role and a function and say no, behind that there's an essence of philosophy and I have to defend that even at the cost of the institution and the role and everything. Uh, and you can't say you know in advance, you, you certainly don't see it uh, while you're taking these risks, at least, you know, maybe in the movies, um, Charlton Heston, whenever God's in the picture, um, there's a halo behind him, there's special music, you know, it, it's wonderful. But in real life, you know, no, no. What, what there is is Job's comforters. 
you stupid, silly, self-destructive, short-sighted, you know, um, uh, naive person. Uh, don't you know how the world works? Well, that's what, instead of that music and that halo, that's what you hear. And, you know, you, you certainly don't discern a plan. You, you just, um, I can't, well, the reasons I, I gave why, in, in the case where I answered my colleague as I not so tactfully did, um, that's why. I just wanted to make a comment, um, Abigail. I'm a friend of Abigail's, and like this gentleman here, I'm not Jewish, but I love the God of the Bible and the God of Israel. And I just want to say that your description of a pilgrim is beautiful. And I see every story in the Bible led by pilgrims, of people who believe in this God and go through really hard things and somehow have hope that even though things are going to be difficult, that there's, there's a purpose. And um, your story and your life, to be honest, Abigail, knowing you, um, you're a pilgrim in my life. And I appreciate your story, and I thank you for sharing it. Thanks so much, Tara. You know, I think um, people think hope is somehow unintelligent and unsophisticated and not modern, not postmodern. Um, I think despair warrants more of that sort of disparagement even though sometimes it can wash over one and one can feel almost helpless to set it back. Uh, but since you just, do, since you don't know how this story is going to play out, uh, despair seems premature. If there are no further questions, once again, thank you very much.